Hi, everyone. Hold on to your horses and tighten up your britches. Today, I have yet another set of shocking stories that are sure to make your head spin. You might even learn the truth about something that makes it impossible for you to sleep tonight. So get yourself comfortable, grab your favorite drink, and cozy up with that subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. I'm a retired school teacher in Illinois, and I've been a camp host since 2016. It's a relaxing job for someone who loves the outdoors. It doesn't pay much, but you can set up your camper in a picturesque location and camp for free all summer. So that really was the appeal for me. I'm there for all the campers who have problems, and to be honest, that hardly ever happens. Most weeks go by with me only talking to one or two of the campers occupying the sites just chit-chat, and I also make the rounds every night at dusk to sell firewood out of my pickup truck. I talked to the young couple in Campsite 7 when they first arrived, and we had a nice chat. They were in their mid-twenties and planned to do some hiking in the area. They had a little white dog with them, a mixed breed, I think, and they said it loved to camp. I was a little concerned one day when I didn't see the couple as I made my rounds in the evening. I took a peek again at 11.30 p.m. and they still weren't back. They told me they were staying for a week and their tent was still up and their car was there. People have to register if they plan to backcountry camp and they hadn't registered to do that, nor had they mentioned any plans of that sort. At first, I thought maybe they had some friends in the area that had picked them up and were staying over in town for a night. But when the second night came and they still weren't back, I began to get worried. Now... I'm not a babysitter. People can come and go as they please. And at the time, I thought it was possible that I just kept missing them. After all, I couldn't see their sight from my camp host site. But the next morning, after that second night, I went to clean the restrooms, and I drove by their campsite. Alarm bells immediately went off. Their little dog was there, sniffing all over the ground, and their tent had blown down. I walked over, and the dog trotted up and licked my hand, whining. He seemed so grateful to see someone. I called hello a few times, but I could tell his owners weren't in the area. So I scooped the little fellow back up and brought him back to my site to give him some food. Poor thing gobbled up a hamburger like he was starving. His coat was all dirty with twigs caught in it, and he was trembling, so I decided to call my supervisor. I reported the couple as potentially lost in the woods, and the authorities sent out a small search party. I volunteered to take care of the pup while we waited. I really felt bad for the little guy. It took almost a whole day, but I was greatly relieved when a truck rolled in with the young couple in the passenger seat. They were dirty and scratched up, and the volunteer that brought them in took me aside and said he thought they were suffering from hallucinations. He'd already radioed in that they'd been found, so I knew there would be paperwork to fill out. I lent them a couple of blankets to wrap up in and made some coffee. The woman was so happy to see her dog, she burst into tears. Then they told me what had happened. The man said they'd been hiking along the ridge and their dog started barking at something behind them. He said they were afraid it was a bear since they both were carrying food in their backpacks. You're not supposed to do that, Duptu. They scooped up the dog and made a lot of noise, clapping their hands and talking loud, trying to scare it off. But then the woman spotted it. She said it absolutely was not a bear. She told her husband it looked like a gorilla, but it was smart, hiding behind the trees whenever they stopped. She was really shaken up, so he told me most of the story himself. The fellow said at first he didn't believe her. He thought her mind was playing tricks on her, but then the creature got bolder and came out in the open. He told me it had to be seven feet tall and it had massive arms and legs, standing on two legs and covered in fur all except for its face. I looked the young man in the eye as he told me this, and it was plain he believed what he was saying. I've had my share of lies told to me, being a schoolteacher for 27 years, but this fellow wasn't lying. He said he believed this creature was the Bigfoot. He told me it started acting aggressive, stalking them, and they had no choice but to run. The poor woman started crying as her husband told me the next part. They were so scared of the creature that when the little dog slipped out of her grasp, He grabbed her arm and wouldn't let her stop running. It was going to attack us, he said. It felt bad, but we had to get away. They wound up hiding in one of the caves up on the ridge. 
He said once they got to higher ground, they started throwing rocks at it and kicking logs and debris down the side of the mountain, trying to make a rock slide so it couldn't reach them. It stayed down below, making these horrible screeches of anger. He said all through the night while they stayed up in higher elevation, trying to find shelter and stockpiling rocks and fallen limbs for ammunition. The next morning, they didn't see it and tried to find their way back, but they'd gotten so turned around when they were running, they found themselves hopelessly lost. They spent their second night up in a tree, he said, using straps on their backpacks to loop over limbs so they wouldn't fall. They were both dirty and covered in scratches, and it was not a stretch to believe they had been fighting to survive. But then the forest rangers showed up. They listened rather skeptically and suggested it was a bear. The couple disagreed, and the rangers became irritated, really tearing down their story. The man finally lost his cool and said he didn't care what they thought. It wasn't a bear, and he was going to go to the local news and report what he'd seen. That's when things got ominous. One of the many vehicles that had rolled back in with the search teams was a black SUV. No one had emerged from the vehicle until that moment. It sounds crazy, but I wonder if they had a listening device in the vehicle, because once the young man started getting irate, this fellow got out. He came up to the couple and said something in a low tone that I couldn't hear and flashed some ID. Next thing I know, he escorts them over to the SUV and they all got in, even the dog, and drove away. I asked the ranger who that was, and he looked around like he was afraid to be caught telling and mumbled, Homeland Security. I don't know what to think of that. I never saw the couple again. I got up the next morning and their campsite was cleared out. I caught the story on the local news and it said the missing couple had been found by the search team, unhurt. All the story said was they had gotten lost in the forest. So I guess that young man never got to tell a local news what he saw after all. I've heard you read some pretty crazy stories before, so I thought, what the heck? Maybe I should write to your channel. I wasn't planning on telling this to anyone, but, well, I've been seeing the headlines lately. Maybe this isn't just me being out in the sun too long. So, I work in Big Bear City in the mountains of California. I work hospitality at one of the resorts in the area while I'm working on my degree in studio arts. I'm a landscape painter, and Big Bear is perfect for my style. The resort even has some of my canvases hanging in the reception lodge. On my off time, I spend a lot of hours hiking around Big Bear Lake. It's beautiful, with a lot of different vistas and angles to make my work interesting. The series I'm working on now is featuring the lake itself. And this is important to know, because what I want to tell you happened at the lake. Big Bear had some serious snow over the winter. I mean, there were ridiculous amounts of the stuff. People's houses collapsed and you could forget about getting through the roads. And all that snow, once it melted, made the lake fuller than it had been in years. Since Big Bear Lake is a reservoir, that's a good thing. And it's a great thing for the resorts and fishermen and artists like me. I'd hiked along the alpine pedal path until I found a good wide view of the lake. I wanted a calm vista for this painting. Think Bob Ross style. Maybe it's not brilliant art, but it's relatable and people like it. I set up my portable easel out of the flow of traffic and I got to work. The thing about being an artist is that you tend to pick up on more details than you consciously realize. I was working on the mountains around the lake more than the lake. And when I got to the water itself, I kept looking up to check how the sunlight glittered in the surface. I remembered that it was a bright day. Lots of light, right? I did a lot of scratching gold lines with my palette knife. I like to work with undertones, especially when I do water, because it adds depth and realism to the painting. So I kept working back to the blues and turquoise mixes that I had made, cutting in some gray. Painting takes longer than most people think, and the sun was starting to go down by the time I packed up. It was as I was painting this painting that I noticed something weird. I'd gotten in the zone to paint the lake, and I'd done a lot of referencing. But I'd also painted dots of red in the water. I checked the lake again just to be sure, but the lighting was bad, and I couldn't see anything weird. Now this bugged me all the way home. 
Why had it painted red in the water if it hadn't been there? The pattern in the painting was static, not floating on the top of the water, and I'd used a crimson as an undertone, not as a complementary element like a floating leaf. I decided I didn't want to worry about it. I had to present my portfolio the next day at class, and that was all I had to worry about. But when I set all my paintings out in chronological order in the class exhibit, I noticed something else. All of my views of Big Bear Lake had the same touches of red in the same place. Now that suggested a submerged object. I pointed the pattern out to my teacher, and he agreed that it looked like I had unconsciously referenced something under the water. The lake had been in a drought period for a few years, so it wasn't impossible that someone's fishing boat had sunk, been revealed, and then re-recovered by the rising water level. Not a big deal and nothing I really cared about. Art is in the eye of the beholder, and as long as my teacher was happy, I was happy. None of that sounds weird, I know, and that's because it didn't feel weird until this next part. That pattern just kept bugging me. I wanted to see if I could find it in real life, so I headed back out to the lake. The day I managed to go was a clear but gray day. The altitude makes the sun really intense, so even though it wasn't sunny, the reflections on the lake were bright. I made sure I got to that same point along the path so that I could look at the right section of the lake. I didn't really see anything. I think the wind ruffled the surface of the water and made it impossible to see what was under. I decided to take a break and walk more along the path, thinking that maybe a different vantage point would be good. I trekked around Big Bear Lake for the rest of the morning, and by lunchtime I had managed to spot several reddish undertones under the water. Only when the conditions were right, though. At that point, I started to think that this wasn't a submerged fishing boat, because there was no way the same boat would be in all of these spaces. The only other thing I could think was that it was several boats that had all sunk, and maybe that would make more sense. But when I looked at the huge expanse of the lake, I wasn't convinced. That feeling nagged me all the way home again. I had to do something about it. Step one was checking the Friends of Big Bear Eagle Cam. One of the cameras has a great view of the whole lake. It was beautiful, but too far out to see what I was looking for. When I went to work the next day, though, I heard one of the guests saying something about drone photography. And, oh man, did that give me an idea. I had a friend who had a nice drone, not one of those cheap ones. So I should be able to get some good airtime and decent shots of the lake. He even agreed to come with me to help. I mean, what do I know about a drone? Besides, I wasn't the one with the license. Before we went, I took a map of Big Bear Lake and I marked the areas that I thought that I had seen something in red. The pattern was weird, like a triangle with an extra leg or something. I don't even know what kind of shape that is. We waited for a good day with low wind and high visibility so air currents didn't make the water too choppy. All the hike in, I kept telling myself that I was making a mountain out of a gopher hill. It was some natural phenomenon brought on by snowmelt and maybe climate change. Or it was trash dumped in the lake. Actually, that was what I thought we were going to find. The Valley Authority was going to have fun trying to get it out, but that wasn't my problem. But, in the end, it wasn't trash. It was something else. My friend piloted this drone over the spots I marked, and although the water wasn't too clear, we could see something. It was reddish, just like I had painted, deep in the water. And it wasn't four points like I had thought. There were actually nine. We found them as we moved the drone in a clockwise search pattern. Nine sunken fishing ships at equidistant points. Now I'm an artist. I know a pattern when I see one. This thing, whatever it was, looked like a circle marked by big red bumps. My friend thought an archaeological site had been uncovered, but I wasn't convinced. I shouldn't have noticed that red tint under the water if it was from a painted rock. It was too deep. It had to be, because I had seen red light. 
I was seriously starting to consider whether we should call the police or the mayor or something when the drone cam spotted something else in the center of the circle. And this thing looked weirdly reflective. Maybe metal? I don't know. While I was thinking about what to do, my friends started shouting. The drone cam was starting to fizzle out, and the drone itself was starting to bob dangerously low over the water. He tried to pilot it back in, but all of a sudden, the thing just took a nosedive into the water. The camera showed nothing but static. And if that wasn't weird enough, the drone's battery had been at half. There was no reason for it to die. We didn't have time to think about what to do because all of a sudden, both of us just felt really dizzy and nauseous. I felt like I had an incredible headache coming on. Just a terrible migraine. I've never had one hit that fast. The next thing I knew, my friend was shaking me awake, and there was a group of hikers standing around us, and I was on the ground. My head felt like my brain was pushing its way out of my ears, and I couldn't talk without being sick. The hikers called emergency services, and we got taken home when we both refused medical treatment. Maybe that wasn't the best idea. Maybe we should have gone to the ER. But honestly, I doubt that they would have found anything, and I couldn't stand the idea of sitting in a brightly lit room waiting for hours for a doctor to tell me I was faking it. Now we haven't gone back to the lake since. I don't think I want to see if whatever we saw is still there. Actually, I think I'm more scared to find out that it isn't there anymore, because if it isn't, I really don't know what it was. My Lake series paintings are going to be the last ones I ever do of Big Bear Lake. I think I'm going to stick to happy little trees in the woods from now on. I live in Northern Virginia and used to love getting out and exploring some of the lesser known spots of the area. There's a park that almost no one knows about that's a real throwback to pre-Civil War times. There are completely untouched antebellum homesteads. There's a Revolutionary War wagon route and old Civil War trenches and quite a few random graves. I'm personally fascinated with that era, and so it's always interesting for me to look around there. It's all located along a trail behind fancy neighborhoods and golf courses. The trail is over 20 miles long, but I guess most people don't have time for that kind of history. I was there one day and I came upon an old brick chimney There's no sign of the house that used to surround it, just the chimney. I found it in a clearing that surprisingly did not look very overgrown. And there was a little hearth in front of the chimney, with a small stone fireplace opening. What struck me was how clean it looked, like someone had swept it recently. I poked around and I spotted a little trail at the edge of the clearing. I followed it into the woods about a hundred feet and I came to where there was about a three-foot stone wall, marking out a rectangular piece of property. On one edge, I found this old stairway leading down to what I assumed was a stone cellar. There was a wooden door down there that was a little bit propped open. It started to feel creepy, but also I was fascinated, and I couldn't help but go down to take a look. I pulled the door open and turned on my flashlight. Inside, I found a wooden table and a few chairs. There were wooden shelves against the walls, and I saw old glass jars of food on the shelves. It looked like flour and cornmeal and seeds and such. There were also a few piles of stuff, such as old rags and clothes. I started thinking that maybe somebody was squatting there. I shined my flashlight around, and I saw that the cellar extended far back and there was a short passage that led to another area. I went through that to a small room that was mostly dirt, more like a hiding hole than anything. And there was also all this black powdery stuff on the floors and against the walls. In one spot, there was a little pile that looked like old rotten fruit. I didn't know what to think about that. I kept wondering if it was a person or an animal who had been hanging out there. I didn't have much more time to explore that day, So I left and went back home. So then it was probably about a month later before I was back in the area. I had had a hard day at work and it always calmed me down to get out on the trail and let go of some of the stress. 
This time, I found what looked like an old family graveyard, and I was trying to read the names and the dates. Some of the names were so faded that I got really into trying to figure out some of the family history. Eventually, it had gotten later than I realized and started to rain. I wasn't prepared with a hat or raincoat or anything, but this graveyard was really close to that old chimney that I had found before. I decided that I would go and wait out the rain in that cellar since I was at least a mile from my car. I was sure it wasn't going to rain for long. I found the chimney easily and headed for the cellar. The door was a bit open, just like before, and I went in and sat down in one of the chairs. Now, I always carry a notebook and a pen, so I pulled those out and my flashlight, and I started making some notes. Part of me always thought that I would eventually write a little book, a history book of the area. So I was there less than half an hour when I started hearing rustling noises. I thought maybe there was an animal down the passageway in that little room. It was just a soft rustling though, so I'm thinking maybe mice or something. But then it got louder, and then I thought I heard a weird flapping sound. So by now I'm freaking out, thinking there's a bat in there. I stuffed my things in my pockets and started heading for the door was glad that it had stopped raining. I made sure to leave the door open again when I went up the stairs. It was around dusk now, but I was curious about who was in there, and so I went and sat on the stone wall furthest from the cellar door. I hoped whatever it was would come out, and I would see it. I didn't really think it would, but after about ten minutes, something did start opening the door, and next I was able to make out this shadowy shape Okay, I was really freaking out now because it was something quite big, like five or six feet tall. Before I had much time to think, it jumped all of the steps at once. It then turned its head towards me, but I didn't see any face. But I did see these terrible, horrible red eyes that looked like they were glowing and searing right at me. I tried getting to my feet and I just tumbled backwards off the wall. I crouched down there, looking over, and I kid you not, this thing spread out these huge, black, leathery-looking wings, and it half-jumped, half-flew up into the trees. Oh. My. Goodness. I split out of there, running as fast as possible toward my car. I'm no runner, and by the time I got there, I thought I was going to die. I finally calmed down enough to drive, but all I could think on the way home was how I had been in the cellar with that thing only, like, ten feet away from me. How could that thing be real? What was it? Needless to say, I never went back down in the cellar again. I hail from a family of renowned hunters. My siblings and I grew up listening to my father's tales of exotic hunts in Africa, in the time our great-grandfather bought off a a six-and-a-half-foot grizzly with nothing but a knife. So, it's no surprise that I developed a knack for the hunt at an early age. And I know that a female interested in hunting might seem unusual to some people. In Oregon, it's a lot more common than you might think. Whenever I did go hunting, it would always be in the company of either my older brother or father, who learned the tricks of the trade from his father who learned what he knew about hunting from his father before him, and so on. It wasn't that I couldn't hunt on my own or that I needed help to do the heavy lifting, but having been on what must be hundreds of outings into the great outdoors, you soon come to learn that animals are not the only thing to be on the lookout for, and having company is a good way to be safe of the dangers that lurk in the woods. I was always going on about hunting in the outdoors to my friends, one of them who was studying forestry at Oregon State University. She told me about a hunting and forestry trail in the area that she thought was worth checking out. It was in the Corvallis area, and it belonged to a sustainable logging company. The company was nice enough to offer free permits to anybody who wanted to hunt and hike on the land. They also gave lectures at the College of Forestry at Oregon State, and this gave my friend access to the permits rather easily but most importantly, access on the weekends, which was the quietest time to explore their property without having to worry about other hunters and hikers getting in your way. Since the permit belonged to my friend and I always took my older brother with me on my hunts, 
we all made reservations to explore the lands on an upcoming Saturday in March 2010. When the day finally came, I could barely contain my excitement, which was only heightened by the fact that we weren't technically permitted to hunt in March. However, if we got caught, my friend claimed to know of the perfect spot to catch deer that was far from any logging activities and free from the prying eyes of law enforcement. Not knowing her to be someone who would make something like that up, we took her on our word and we arrived at Starker Forest early in the morning. The sheer size of the land and the forests within it was astonishing. Some areas were dense evergreen forests while others were reserved for logging. Still, other areas were open spaces with thick stumps in the spots where once mighty trees stood. The majority of the forest was quiet and the only people we encountered were loggers on the job and park rangers doing their rounds. Since visitors weren't technically permitted to explore on weekends, my friend's student card served as a handy tool to stop any suspicion. Also, our bags were big enough to conceal the one Montana X3 rifle we had hidden to hunt the deer. Dawn had come and gone with us, heading deeper into the forest far away from any loggers and rangers. And it started to seem as though we were lost, even though my friend insisted she had taken the route before. That's when we started to find strange things and started experiencing an overwhelming feeling that something sinister was watching us at a distance. It started with some brush that looked like it was broken and pushed aside by a very large creature, not an elk or a deer. And then we found a deer carcass, or what was left of it, just the head and the spine that were so fresh you could still see the red in the meat. At this point, my brother had his rifle drawn, and just then our feelings of unease slowly turned into terror as the sound of footsteps became louder. We could hear that whatever it was, was now less than 20 feet from us, and closing the distance fast. My brother promptly responded by firing in the direction of the noise, which caused whatever it was to scream violently and become more erratic with its steps, but not slow down. And now it began to run in our direction, and we could now see the creature behind all the commotion. A huge, gaunt figure emerged from the brushes, running straight towards us. Had I not been in the woods with two other people, I would have thought I was seeing things. Slowly, the creature came into my line of sight, and I was shocked to see a giant wolf that was running on its hind legs like a human. Its head was that of a typical wolf, but its body was more like that of a distorted person similar to what you see in werewolf movies. It howled in agony, almost tumbling down as it charged towards us, with its howl almost sounding like the screams of a man. While my friend and I paused in fear, my brother was quick to react, and he fired off a round from the rifle. This caused the creature to veer off course and run for cover into the trees. Although it was only a warning shot, it definitely scared the creature away. I was disheveled and almost scared to death, but managed to check the time, seeing it was 7 o'clock at night. We instantly said it would be wise if we left the area immediately, before the creature decided to come back and tried its luck a second time. We were intercepted by two rangers as we made a run for what we hoped was the exit. And although hunting off-season is a punishable offense, after seeing how shaken up we were, we were escorted to the property gate with only a warning. Must be karma. You all running into a predator out there, the one ranger said to us. What did you see out there anyway, kids? We all looked at each other for a split second before I said, a bear. We came across a bear. I knew that none of us would want to open the can of worms by telling him what we really saw. But my thought is, he already knew. <laughs>